Hey everyone, thank you so much for joining us for our second Now Power Chat of 2021. We're super thrilled to have Evan Johnson here. Evan, thank you for agreeing to hang out with us for a little bit this evening. It's um, a total pleasure. Evan was the winner of the 2013, I believe, uh, commission competition. Um, and so we have this really wonderful work that Jeff is going to ask sort of our first yeah, question about. So uh, my Paul Hurt and going over the piece that you wrote for us in uh, 2013 has this uh, a, a kind of special performative space that it exists in. Uh, I first got to know your work with the, the solo voice piece, a uh, general interrupter to ongoing activity. And I think that the load band piece and that share a kind of alteration of performative space. Right, like the voice piece is all about all these tiny interior manipulations and and changes within the vocal tract uh, that aren't necessarily for the audience. Like they're not they're not things that are seen by the audience in the same way that if you had a violinist doing all kinds of things, you know, bowing sides of the instrument, everyone sees that. Whereas I'm just on stage sort of negotiating something for myself. Similarly, the, the, the load bang piece, we're not in our normal semicircle. We're faced in towards each other a little bit. And, and you say that the performative space of the piece isn't out towards the audience, but is, is sort of in between all the players. Uh, where did, where does this idea come from? What, what led you to this kind of an interiority? Um, well, here, here's the thing. I, uh, I think that for me anyway, the really pressing question of being a composer these days is what, what's the point? Um, why, why, what is this music doing? Um, what is it for? There's already too much music. Um, there's already too much sound from my perspective. Um, for me, therefore, I think um, I'm really critically interested in what it means to be in this sort of strange situation of the concert experience. Um, what it means to be in this situation that more and more is sort of an exception in people's lives of still contemplation, directed attention, directed communal attention. And for me, sort of the, the purpose of my work in the world, I guess, is to facilitate or to sort of amplify that situation. And for me, therefore, there's the one way to one way to do that is to just enforce or suggest or sort of um, render necessary this atmosphere of concentration. And that concentration is not just for the audience, although the fact that most of my work is so quiet um, involves the sort of you know breath held, lean forward sort of atmosphere certainly encourages it. Um, but it's also meant for the performers in in ways both visible and invisible or audible or inaudible or perceptible or imperceptible um, to really not that performers don't usually concentrate on what they're doing, of course, but to sort of turn up to the utmost level of intensity, this commun this communion with themselves. Um, and I think that that is more than anything having to do with, you know, emotional communication from me to the audience or even communication of material from me to the audience. That's what my work is trying to do, to create this sort of um, almost unbearably sort of intense, semi-shared, semi-private space to inhabit together. Yeah, the there's always a, I feel like I give uh, sort of warnings before your music more than I do with anyone's music <laughs> in a concert. I, I, I always end up telling people like, just like, if you got your program on your lap, or you're a little uncomfortable, like you need to just set it down and and uh, you know strap in because this is this is going to be very focused and very quiet, and you are going to become a part of this in a certain way uh, mm -hmm. that is not always is not required necessarily with other music. Uh, both both in the way of the the sort of uh, focus of of perception and attention that you say, and also in the sort of sonic sense. I feel like the audience accidentally ends up being a part of the piece more readily if they are not uh, engaged in that same way. Is that something that uh, 
that you invite or that bothers you or that is is not particularly important uh like outside noise noise from audience noise in a concert hall no it's not something i sort of i mean i i if i could wish it away i would <laughs> i think the sort of the the ambient noise sort of thing um but i think i i certainly accept its inevitability um i I really, it sometimes happens that my work has to be amplified. The premiere general interrupter, for example, was amplified because it was in this big um, sort of raked seating hall of the transit festival. And, you know, I, I, I first I fought that, but then I gave up because it was obviously the important, an important thing to do. But um, it's more important to me that people, it's okay if people feel like they're missing things. I think that's really sort of actually crucial to what I'm trying to do as a composer. There's stuff on the page that won't be heard um, for many reasons, for all sorts of unrelated reasons. But the idea of this sort of leaning forward, reaching for something. Um, I've been thinking a lot actually about the piece I'm writing now for clarinet and C and piano is called Contemptus Mundi. And it's all about ecstasis and the sort of the, the quasi theological concept of ecstasis, sort of you know, transcending oneself and finding oneself outside of oneself. And I think that. Um, that image, the idea that you are in, in a body, in a performance space as an audience member, um, you're being invited to into, into a really sort of unusual transcendental space. Um, as sort of a premise, which is, you know, I'm making, without even making any grand claims for the work itself, for the sounding material, for, you know, what's going on in the piece from beginning to end. But again, just the act of ritual, um, the act of um, holding your breath, you know, it's, you know, I, I, I'm loath to, to say it, to make it this sort of trivial thing, but it reminds me of this, you know, the, the mandate to wear a mask, you know, it's something you do for your fellow audience members. <laughs> you, you hold them, you hold your breath, you lean forward. Um, and things happen. My pieces, my work in the past has been drowned out by air conditioning. It's been, <laughs> um, I've had my fair share of trucks and emergency vehicles and recordings ruined by all sorts of things three blocks away. But that's you know that's that's life and it's it's part of my commitment to live performance and to sort of what is really fundamentally important about live performance i find your sound world to be very unique and interesting in so many ways we've seen uh composers work with silence and we've seen most famously with cage kind of the idea of there is never silence and that's the piece itself but I don't necessarily know that we've seen composers who really exploit the vulnerability that comes with trying to be so quiet, which is what I love about your music and I find is such a unique take. Um, when I think of how composers usually come up, we usually like come up in these big systems, listening to all these romantic symphonies, all these big pieces with Beethoven and the genius composer archetype like looming over us at all times. I'm curious, um, did you feel like you were coming out of that when you first started composing or were you always interested in these ideas? Uh, I'd love to know more about your evolution as a composer from when you started writing music into this really unique and interesting view. Well, it's funny um, because I actually started composing, I think when I was about four, um, which now that I have a five-year-old, I realize how weird that is. <laughs> <laughs> the idea of him doing that is just, you know, what, what you know, what are you doing, kid? Um, and so, I, you know, I, I wrote sort of little piano pieces in imitation of the things I was learning in the piano. And I, yeah, so at the time I started, you know, I have a, I still have all my old notebooks, you know, with my very childish, messy handwriting, things like Sonata in D and all, and all these things. Um, and I, I was, uh, I had a piano teacher in high school who was also a composer, completely unlike me. He wrote sort of um, jazz inflected piano music and things like this. And um, he introduced me to, you know, 20th century music, basically non-standard repertoire music, George Crumb, um, things like that. And that was sort of, that sort of did it for me, <laughs> I guess. Um, and then I had an experience in, in college, um, I was an undergraduate at Yale, which is a great university, of course, the music department in the undergraduate level, especially, although both, and was extremely conservative. And I, uh, I was always the weird one already. <laughs> As a freshman, I was the weird one. And then I discovered in the 
music library, just sort of screwing around one afternoon, I discovered the score of La Suite Car by Brian Farnieho. And, uh, and I had one of these sort of, you know, <laughs> textbook revelatory moments, like, you know, you can do this sort of thing. And I was, you know, I was a math nerd too. So that was, you know, I, I dug all the numbers and the tuplets and stuff. And from there, I, you know, I became really interested in new complexity and this, and this sort of thing. And this was at age 20 or whatever. And from there, it became just sort of this process of distillation into what was interesting to me about that actually, you know, and um, it's still there, of course, when music has a lot of tuplets still, a lot of very, um, I don't like to say complex, I don't like to say difficult, but very sort of precise rhythms. Um, things are placed very precisely in time with all the notational apparatus that implies. Um, but for me, over the years, it became less and less about difficulty and less and less about virtuosity and of, of that sort and less and less about um, this idea of trying to um, just wrestle the performer into submission and make them fail on stage for, you know, I have pieces like that, that, you know, that still get played once in a while. There's something of that in General Interrupter, the, vo the vocal solo that Jeff was talking about still in 2011. But it became more and more about this, this idea of vulnerability um, and about and of fragility and contingency and that, that aspect of, the, of that project, right? Of the complexity project. And so gradually I, I've stank into this world of, you know, extreme quiet and fragmentation. Um, and not that the music is easy, you guys know that, this music is still incredibly difficult and incredibly demanding, but it's, um, I think, I, I hope it's demanding in a way that is less, um, I don't know, less show-offy, <laughs> less, less sort of, certainly less sadistic, less, you know, um, less song and dancey. I still love Fanny. I don't mean I shouldn't describe his work in these terms, um, but but more actually human and more genuine, um, and more in in some ways sort of more directly expressive of that uh, of, of the productive conceit of performers working really hard to tell you something that they can't quite tell you, um, and I think that that's what stuck with me from that formative experience with new complexity, which is now almost twenty years ago. That's my story from age four to age forty in, <laughs> in two minutes. Yeah, but, uh, just, just now you mentioned uh, Crom and Ferdinand. Yeah. I wanted to, to, to follow on to that and ask about if you had any other composers which, uh, who really inspired your work or like influenced you in any way. And uh, the second question following into this, you mentioned you know, extremely quiet sounds and fragility. Where do you get your inspiration for most, most of, the, of your work? Um. Well, some of those answers are sort of the same, but along, you know, beside the sort of how I found my way in contemporary music, right? Because we all have to find our way and sort of have our, establish our premises and our style and um, the things that we reject so as to be able to do anything at all. And for me, that starts with Fernie Ho and then devolves into whatever I'm doing now. Um, I am, if anything, even more interested in early music, in medieval music, in Baroque music, in the French Baroque in particular, in their ideas of, of how the music itself is not the har harmonic motion or the rhythmic motion, it's in the ornaments that, that are on top of it, it's in the cracks between the notes, it's in the performance style. Um, and also in, in medieval music in the sort of, you know, these, um, these masses of, of Achigam, for instance, or, um, or things like this, where these sub the idea of these sort of subterranean structures, I'm really attracted by the idea of things that are not meant to be heard, right? Things in music that are, either for the performers to just sort of live and absorb and then digest and to what to, um, to ends that are not specified, you know, so notational devices that are purely for the performers or um, structural devices that are not meant to be, you know, again, like guiding lines for the ear per se. Um, this idea of music as sort of a hermetic act or that it's something that's allowed to contain secrets is really important to me. There are also, um, there's one among contemporary composers, there's a composer, I don't know how well known he is in the US, but I sort of discovered him by chance, named, named Brice Posé, who's a French composer who, who lives in, um, in Freiburg now and teaches there, who, who wrote some pieces around the turn of the century that I still think of as sort of lodestars for what I'm doing. He wrote a, um, a lot of canons, almost all my pieces are canons. Uh, piece of Huicanon, eight canons for Obadamari and Ensemble, which to me is one of the great pieces of the late 20th century. 
um, in large part, is one of those pieces that I could say, even today, I wish I had written this piece because it's about Baroque music. It's about the Goldberg variation, just about ornament. Um, but it's so just utterly graceful and so utterly um, just, it's, it's, just a, it's just a beautiful piece. I don't know what to tell you. If, if people if people watching this want to listen to it, it's on Spotify and YouTube and things. Um, but for inspiration, I think um, in some ways I'm also, I'm a deeply conservative composer because I'm interested very much in the idea of communication, right? I'm interested in performers trying to tell us something. And I'm interested in as I said before, the, the vulnerability of the performer in that position. And this idea that we are, um, that we're witnessing this sort of expressive ritual, that we're witnessing a sort of, um, a sort of inescapable frailty in this, in this encounter with another human being. Um, the, the older I get, the more music I write, the more I sort of distill why I'm still doing this, you know? It's it's really about that. I think it's about um, putting the performers in a situation to be vulnerable with the audience, and vice versa in terms of this, you know, <laughs> this holding of the breath and so on. Um, I'm interested. I mean, my music is at, at its core. I think in terms of the gestures, in terms of the pitch content, the melodic content, it's very traditional. There's a lot of diatonic writing hidden underneath the surface. Um, the gestural shapes, I think, are often pretty traditional, albeit completely fragmented and, and blown apart. Um, but it's it's really about sort of the, the human phenomenon for me at the end of the day. I remember, um, so when we first got your piece, we had rehearsed it, we had learned it, and I think you met us at Greenwich House down in the village, if I'm remembering yep. correctly. You gave me a t-shirt. Uh, and we were gracious. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> let, let me know if you need more, if you if you <laughs> continue to rep the brand. Uh, I, I remember um, being a little apprehensive about the, the rehearsal process because I didn't know exactly what you, I didn't know you at all yet mm. uh, personally and didn't know exactly what you were hoping for or what we were going to talk about because there's so much in the piece that's just incredibly difficult just in terms of like making the thing happen on the instrument. Um, and then we did the rehearsal and I remember being so struck by how the comments and the conversation almost all um, surrounded phrase and line and these very, very traditional ways that we, we think about um, traditional music making. And there's a connection there, I think, for sure, hearing you talk about like writing, writing piano sonatas as a four year old, right? There's this <laughs> like deep connection to common practice music, but even in the notation, there's certain aspects, certain elements of the notation that are very new, are very uniquely yours, are very complicated. But then there are these sweeping gestures, like these phrase marks that are really mm. beautiful. Like a, the way they look is beautiful and they communicate this line. There's this, um, all these expression markings, very detailed expression markings in Italian. So it feels like reading uh, traditional music in that way. And you're American and we're all Americans and you could be writing this in English, but there's something about the Italian that makes it feel different, mm. a, a connection to that. I wonder where um, where that comes from. Do you like, cause it, it obviously is a clear decision to do that. Yeah. Um, so what in, in writing like that, what do you, what do you feel like is being communicated to the performers by doing it in that way? Um, well, notation is, is really important to me, as you all know, anyone who's seen a score of mine from the last, I don't know, decade now knows, um, I do everything by hand and ink and it's, uh, it's a very, very laborious process and it makes it impossible to make changes. <laughs> it's, um, but on that level, it's, it's become super important to me to to, to take that time to draw the scores. Um, to my left right now, just, you know, this clarinet piece on the desk and with my pens are all arrayed and the, you know, and the rulers and the pencils and things, because it's become really important to me to feel the material in a literal sense, to have the hand, the hands touch the material um, and to draw those slurs freehand, those wide sort of looping slurs, because that is how I'm feeling the gesture when I'm drawing the line. Um, and the little squiggles that are ornaments or the little detailed 
I mean, there are a ton of articulation markings, staccatos, denudos, accents of various sorts, some standardized, some invented. And when I'm adding those, I'm I'm often I'm almost like dancing at my desk. I'm literally like I'm I'm you know I'll write the accent as if I'm performing an accent, and I'll sort of really, um, it's my equivalent of sort of playing it through in the piano or whatever. I really try to feel the physical gesture in the act of drawing it on the page, um, because it's you know whenever I have students for whom the it comes up or anything, it's one of my absolutely fundamental compositional axioms that notation people underestimate the importance of notation. Um, not just in terms of making it nice and professional and clear and making sure there are no mistakes and you know the you know you follow the the style guides, but that notation as a composer of, of writing music for performers, notation is all you have. Right, notation has to speak for you, and it has to speak for you beyond the notes and rhythms. Right, that's the I, I try to have my scores tell the performer immediately upon opening them something about what the music is on a purely visual level. Um, in terms of the Italian, this is something that. Um, has been somewhat controversial <laughs> with some people over the years. It's something I, I still do, although there's more English creeping in here and there. Um, I always I use English for specific concrete instructions um, and sometimes for um, for overall, like at the beginning of a piece, like the heading with the tempo, you know, the sort of general expressive markings. But um, no, my scores are covered in Italian words. And I use Italian because these words have never in Italian in sort of Common, common practice have never meant just what they mean, right? Andante doesn't actually mean at a walking pace. It means andante, that means something. That means every piece that's ever been labeled andante, right? It means, um, it, it, it invokes a history is what I'm trying to say. And for me, everything about um, my work, <laughs> notationally, materially, um, instrumentally, and is in part meant to evoke a history. This is part of my relationship to medieval music and baroque music and on and on and on. Um, none, neither of which, of course, use <laughs> these Italian expressive markings, but um, the idea that, again, everything is, is freighted in a score, that everything carries a meaning. Um, everything has the sort of weight of history or the weight of gesture, the weight of everything the performer has ever played before, um, the weight of every time a performer has, um, you know, played that particular interval or heard that particular note or um, felt that particular muscular phenomenon. So when they see um, a certain Italian term they have that going for them. Also, um, they tend to recur in a way that has some, something to do with the structure of the piece, with the rhetoric of the piece. I mentioned this piece, the clarinet piece, based, you know, that is sort of um, my reflection on the idea of ecstasis. And the, the term estatico, the Italian, you know, for that is on every page. It's over and over and over again, way more than it needs to be. The Turin doesn't need to know that every phrase, you know, in this passage is marked something quasi estatico, something comi estatico, you know, pianissimo estatico, all these things. But it becomes a sort of insistent drumbeat that hopefully, you know, the idea is that it will sort of um, just, just inflect in some way I can't entirely predict the way the performer thinks about what they see on the page and thinks about what they're doing. This is. Um... This is all making me like not be able to wait to play the piece again. <laughs> uh, Tim McCormick, uh, our, our sort of all mutual friend and colleague actually tossed two questions into the chat here. Um, the first is to the degree that um, sound and blending is important in your work, if at all, how did you reconcile the heterogeneous instrumentation of us for, mm. for the piece? Yeah, the uh, I hate to say it, the, the problem with the trumpet. Um, <laughs> the, there's not the first time one. you've heard that, I'm sure. <laughs> yeah, um, I mean the piece begins and ends um, with this sort of baritone bass clarinet um, duo. It's a very sparse, frag you know, fragmentary sort of muttering, very quiet um, duo. And when the the other when the brass comes in. Um, the trombone is a sort of, you know, unfocused tone, the sort of mid-register thing that is sort of a, a smearing of the bass clarinet rhetoric. It's sort of a, um, a sort of like a like an imprecise echo. And the trumpet is over top of these very, 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 very high, quiet, as I'm sure you painfully remember, um, <laughs> material that's very demanding, um, very sort of um, pinched in a way. And for me, I think that, it, it wasn't really a question of blending 
um, because I think I gave up on that idea pretty early, except when it's just uh, voice and bass clarinet. It was a question of reflecting on varieties, almost sort of quasi phonetic varieties of quiet, you know, the, the, the quiet high trombone, um, the quiet mid register trom sorry, high register trumpet, the quiet mid register, mid register trombone, uh, sort of almost um, explosions of the vowel sounds of the voice, not in any sort of um, technical or sort of rigorous way, but as a um, as a way of thinking phonetically about the ensemble. Um, the text I should mention is in early and early English, sort of, I think it's 14th century English. So there's lots of strange vowels, lots of rough consonants going on. And um, it's all sort of parlando so for the Trump, for the trumpet, it's all sort of the sort of spoken, muttered, high pinched nasal sort of thing that is almost sort of, you could think of it as the consonants to the trombone's vowels, some way of thinking through um, the sort of muttered language. Sorry, and then there's a there's another question here. Um, how do you, in, in terms of um, the musicians, the players' interpretation of your score? Because there is so much information, yeah. but I do think that like in these sort of phrase markings, there's this sort of nod to trusting the the player to phrase to do this sort of natural thing. Um, how do you do you sort of strike a balance between? The, like this is what's on the page. This is what needs to be executed versus a more sort of old school approach to interpretation of a score. I'm very much interested in interpretation of a score. I think um, the notation itself is extremely precise, extremely demanding. Um, and there is in much of my work, including the, the load bang piece, including the, my poverty, this sense of um, too muchness, <laughs> the sense that there, there's a level of precision that can't be necessarily um, faithfully rendered. And for me, that's not a question of failure. It's a question that's the, the metaphor I use is that it's as if I'm handing a photograph to a watercolor artist and asking them to reproduce it. You know, there's going to be imprecision, um, but the details will be reflected. <laughs> you know, the details will be reflected. They are to be reflected in, um, in the approach. And what I tell to people in rehearsal, especially first rehearsals, when I, you know, when I get a panic look or a skeptical look or, you know, a furious look or whatever the look may be at the first rehearsal, um, what I tend to say is the the first job of the performer here is to um, is twofold. One, it's to decide what is the most important thing, right? Um, and every, that's different in every piece. In many pieces, especially including this one, it's a question of phrase, right? It's a question of vocality. It's a question of um, gesture. And then the goal is to make everything else sort of fit into that as, you know, as they see fit. Um, it's not, I mean, I, I insist on the material being what it is. You know, I'm not, I'm not going to write an approximate version. I'm not going to accept a sort of sloppily approximated version. But I, what I do accept and what I expect, in fact, is that these, um, these real life flesh and blood versions will be a response to what's on the page, that, the, that this idea of, well, I mean, let me say this, the idea that a performer is going to transparently and predictably transmit what's on the page is bogus anyway. It always has been bogus. Um, it's, a, it's a false goal. Um, the, uh, the sort of implicit idea that a performer will play something and the audience could write down the score if they were if they would, could just listen attentively enough, you know, complete with dynamics and expression markings and they could reproduce it because the information is perfectly transmitted. Um, that's, that's an unspoken ideal, I think, for a lot of um, people, a lot of no notational approaches, and it's, it's nonsense. Um, things are going to get lost. Things are going to get, um, as I said earlier, sort of digested and repurposed. And um, my notational practice, it just, it accepts that, I think. And, it, and it, it, it tries to take that as granted and turn it to productive ends. Evan, though, I feel like we could stay on and keep chatting. Um, and maybe will, but just not with everybody watching. Uh, it's been a real pleasure to have you. Thank you again for, for agreeing to spend some time with us. This is really lovely. Of course. It's good to see you guys. Yeah, you too. And uh, thanks everybody for listening. Thank you for tossing questions in the chat. Um, our next one is coming up in a few weeks with Scott Wolschlager. So look out for emails and 
ads about that, and we will see everybody soon. Thanks.